Hello and welcome to Real Cheating Story. Man, don't even think about it. About what? Well, since we're on the subject, who is she and what makes you say something like that? My new buddy Lucas just sat back and grinned. Her name is Penn French, you know, like the name of the company you're working for. Her dad owns our company and three more. Why would that matter? He sighed. Look, I went to school with her. She developed early, and combined with who her dad is, every kid from middle school on was interested in her. The mix of her being incredibly attractive and her family's wealth kind of shaped her attitude. She became known for her sense of entitlement and would move on to someone else once she'd gotten what she wanted or was bored. My wife went to college with her and said she did the same thing there. Well then, she's still a striking woman. His wife had joined us and caught the last part of the conversation. She is indeed. And she's single too. We're all around the same age, 28 to 30. If she's been single that long, there has to be a reason. I said as much, and Chloe grinned. Remember Bob, the receiving manager? She was engaged to him for a while, but right before the wedding, she went on a trip to meet clients, found someone she was very interested in, came home, and ended the engagement. She then flew back to her new interest, only to find out he was married with kids. He offered her an apartment as a place for them to meet, and she refused. He lost his job when his company lost her father's business over the incident. She was too embarrassed to return home, so she took a job and stayed away for a couple of years. Her father eventually went and brought her back, she's his only child, so she'll inherit everything when he goes. Even if she were less attractive, she wouldn't lack for male attention because of her family's wealth. How come Bob still works there? Because he wanted to work for her father, not her, and he does a good job. He thought about moving on, but her father convinced him to stay. Besides, he's married now, and they seem very happy, one kid, a couple of years old, and another on the way, rumored to arrive soon. I looked at her again. The woman was tall even without heels. Despite her dark hair being up in a complicated bun, it was obvious she was quite attractive. She glanced over at me with a smirk before turning back to her companion. From that look, I could tell she was beautiful and well-maintained. If I hadn't heard things about her, it would have been hard to believe she was as described, but that smirk gave it away. I'd seen that same smirk many times before. I put her out of my mind and tried to remember the names of people I'd been introduced to and their roles within the company. You can never have too much knowledge. After another hour, I made my excuses and left. I found a local park and went for a run. I used to hate running until I got used to it, and now I find it a pleasant pastime, just clear your head and focus on the terrain. Lately, running had become second nature to me, and sometimes I found myself thinking about different things as I moved. Although I'm not a fanatic about it, I'm in pretty good shape. Back home, they had an event called the 3M Run, based on a military course that involved running three miles to the mountain, three miles up the mountain, three miles down the mountain, and three miles back to the finish line. It was considered an accomplishment just to finish the course, let alone be competitive. I didn't finish the first time I tried, I gave up after coming back down the mountain. I'm good at setting goals and achieving them, and four years later, I won by about three minutes and set a course record. How did I do it? I looked up the original run on YouTube and was amazed to find that not only did the soldiers run it, but they did so wearing a 60 pounds pack and carrying their weapons while singing the entire way. I trained until I could finish the course, then bought a backpack and started adding weight. I began with 10 pounds and thought I was going to die, but gradually added 5 pounds at a time until I could do it with 25 pounds and still sing. By the time I was done, there was no spare weight on my body. That fall, the organizers brought in a squad of soldiers who had run the course for a demonstration. They were a group of very fit individuals who seemed to have an attitude of invincibility and boasted that running the course without a backpack was like a walk in the park. We started out in the same group, but by the time we reached the mountain, they had a 200-yard lead. I pushed ahead and passed them about two-thirds of the way up. There was a lot of shouting and joking as I did, but one guy took it personally and tried to push me. I saw it coming, and when he made his move, I stopped as quickly as I could, causing him to lose his balance and tumble about ten feet down the side of the trail. I noted that no one stopped to help him. 
If people think running up a steep hill is hard, they should try running back down at the same pace. By the time I hit the bottom, I was so far ahead of them that there was no way they could catch up. As I mentioned, it took three minutes before the next runner crossed the finish line, one of the soldiers. By then, I had caught my breath and handed him a water. Thanks, man, he said. Then he looked up and saw who I was. Sorry about the mountain. Jimmy's always been a bit of a jerk. The lieutenant who runs with us isn't happy about his behavior. I'm not worried about it, I replied. We continued to talk, and I ended up showing them some local sites, mostly bars where it was easy to meet people. Jimmy didn't get to come. I decided to run about 10 miles before stopping, and after 2 miles at a moderate pace, I heard someone approaching. Many people ran with headphones on, but I found it prudent to be aware of my surroundings. I had a friend who got caught in a thunderstorm he didn't know was coming because of his headphones, and while trying to find shelter, lightning struck a tree he had just passed. Though he wasn't hit directly, the secondary shock gave him a concussion and put him into a coma for 36 hours. I moved to my left instinctively, and she passed me running at a good pace. As she passed, I saw her smirk and recognized her. She didn't acknowledge me, which didn't bother me, we hadn't been introduced, so she had no reason to know who I was. Pauline was wearing a sports bra and tight leggings, and I didn't mind the view. I unconsciously picked up my pace and stayed about 20 feet behind her. She must have thought she had lost me and seemed surprised when she looked back and saw me keeping up. She moved a bit further ahead, so I did too, staying about 40 feet behind this time. When she glanced back and saw me again, she stopped and blocked the path. Are you following me? She asked, clearly annoyed. Of course I am, I replied with a grin. That startled her, and she responded sharply, stop. Not going to happen, I said. This part of the park is the only trail on this side, so if you're running and I'm running behind you, I'm following you. If you don't like it, run faster or let me pass. Like you could keep up with me, she challenged. I can run as fast and as far as you can. First one to stop loses, I said, and she yelled at me as I ran past her. I maintained a moderate pace, and about 500 yards later, she passed me again. I fell in behind her, and it didn't take her long to realize she had fallen into her own trap. As she slowed, I sprinted past her, increasing my pace. She tried to keep up, but after two miles, she started to flag and eventually stopped at the parking lot. I kept going, completed another lap, and saw her waiting on the trail. You won, she said. Starbucks on 10th and Madison? Sorry, got three more miles to do. Maybe next time, I replied. I pushed myself to finish, and as sweat poured off me, I was catching my breath when a hand holding a towel appeared. I looked up and saw her. Do you do this every time you run? She asked. Most days. Sometimes for my long runs, I answered. I could tell by her eyes she wasn't sure if she believed me. Still on for coffee? I did make the bet, she said. I wiped off, cleaned up as much as I could, pulled on a fresh shirt, and was ready to go. Where did you park? You can follow me, she said. I didn't. My apartment isn't that far away, and I ran here. Of course you did, she said with a smile. Okay, I'll drive. It's only six blocks. She ordered a drink that looked like a core of sugar with whipped cream and sprinkles, which made me wonder how she stayed so slim. She noticed my look and grinned. I work out a lot and I've always had a high metabolism. She glanced at my drink, a medium coffee with just a hint of creamer, and grinned back. I don't, I said. We chatted casually for a few minutes before she asked if I knew who she was. I was surprised I did. How did you know? I was at your father's event last night. You were pointed out to me. In case you haven't figured it out, I work for your father. Her smirk returned. Good. You'll probably be working for me in five years when dad retires. Five years is a long time, Miss French, I said. I've been a nomad since college, and I'm not sure if I have a settling down gene in my body. Why did you take the job then? Because your father can be very persuasive when he wants something, and he wanted me. It's a trait I share, she said with a smirk back. 
I kept a neutral expression as I replied, a good trait to have in business, I'm sure. Thank you for the coffee, Miss French. Maybe I'll see you at work. I could tell she didn't want the conversation to end but didn't have much choice. It occurred to me that I had kind of issued a challenge and hoped she wouldn't take me up on it. When she dropped me off, she looked at my building. I had said apartment, but it was actually a very expensive condo. Your father must pay you pretty well, she remarked. I didn't tell her I was using a unit that belonged to friends who were out of town for a few months and had let me stay there for free. They sent it to the place good to be lived in, and I didn't think they trusted the neighbors much. He does, Miss French. Have a good afternoon. She waited until I entered the building, more out of curiosity than courtesy, before driving away. I really liked her car, an F-Type Jaguar. I had one similar to it. A couple of weeks went by, and I settled into my work. It soon became evident that there weren't many challenges in the job. I usually got everything done in half a day, which left me four or five hours with little to do. I put up with it as long as I could before asking to see Mr. French. He scheduled me in that afternoon and seemed surprised to see me. Are you enjoying your job? He asked, once we got the pleasantries out of the way. Not really, I replied. He didn't seem easily surprised. Did I put too much on you? I can delegate a few things if you want. Quite the opposite, sir, I said. The work only keeps me busy half a day. Do you have anything else I can help with? He looked at me kind of stunned, before laughing and holding up his hand. You're the first person since I started this business who has come to me complaining he doesn't have enough work. Let me savor that for a bit. He thought for a moment and then grinned. I may have something for you, something new I've been wanting to get into. Give me a few days and get back to me. Jason, I think I was right to hire you. You're going to add a lot to our team. Thank you, Mr. French. Have a good day. When I returned, my new assistant had an anxious look on her face. She was really happy I picked her over the other 11 candidates. She wasn't chosen for her looks, though she was very attractive in an exotic way. She was chosen for her intelligence and drive. Of all the candidates, she was the only one who had researched me, asked the right questions about my methods, and understood a few of them. Some had complained privately that I chose her for her looks, but when I asked a few technical questions about what the department was trying to accomplish, Mara was the only one who answered them correctly. I smiled at her. Relax, Marta. Our lives are about to get much more complicated. Good show, sir. When do we begin? I'm afraid we're going to have to fight boredom for a few more days yet. Have you got those charts I asked for sorted, correlated, and annotated on the key issues? You, madam, are looking at an increase in salary when we get our new assignments, I said. She glowed under the praise and turned back to her work. Days later, I received an email from the boss, come by my office when you can spare a minute. I knew from experience that when someone says when you get a minute, it meant I should come as soon as possible, so I went up. He was grinning when I walked in. Have a seat, Jason. I think I have just what you need to keep boredom away. He paused until I was comfortable. For a long time now, we've contributed to various charities as we could. The results have been mixed. A few turned out really well. We investigated another and found that 85 cents out of every dollar was going to administration, so we dropped them. Another we supported, the Go Deep Children's Fund, was doing well until last year. The founder, who was the public face of the charity, got into a scandal over an affair with a married woman. It came to light that he was a serial seducer who preferred married women. He got away with it for years until he chose the wrong woman, or more importantly, the wrong husband. The husband waged a war that destroyed his career and cost him millions. He's out west now with some team or another and is considered radioactive. No one wants anything to do with him. The charity tried to carry on, but the negative exposure became too much, and they folded. It's a shame. He paused gathering his thoughts with a disgusted look on his face. All that being said, I've been thinking about consolidating all of my company's contributions through one outlet. You're that outlet. Think you can handle it? I answered carefully, this isn't exactly what I had in mind and it's a little outside my comfort zone, but I'd really like to try. If I think I'm not doing it the justice it deserves, you'll be the first to know. 
he smiled and filled me in on a few more details. Just before he left, he gave me news that almost broke the deal. I hear you've met my daughter. The reason I bring her up is that she's asked about you, and any event attended will require both of you. I want her to be the new face of this company, and any exposure she can get will help. Will that be a problem? Not that I know of. I've only spoken to her once, and it was outside the office. I'm sure we can get along. We sipped our tea while Marta reviewed the charity information. Should I arrange a tux for you? She asked. Not necessary. I have my own. One day, boss, you're going to have to tell me who you were in a past life. You live in a million dollar condo, drive a brand new Jaguar, and have a tux or two just hanging in the closet. Why are you even here? Terminal boredom and a chance to see how the other half lives. Make sure you have a nice gown and a date. Why? Because I'm going to need a spy. No one will know who you are, and you're quite attractive. Men of all ages make fools of themselves over a pretty woman. Learn what you can. I handed her a card and a note. Go there. They will take care of you. I expect you to stand out at the gala. Marta put quite the effort into my account. She walked in the next morning, sat on my lap, and gave me a warm kiss before giggling and hopping off. Well, if I wasn't intrigued before, I definitely am now. She showed me her dress and said, The dress is fabulous. I've never owned a pair of Louboutin shoes before. Wanna see? She stopped grinning and blushed at my response. More than you could possibly imagine, but let's not go there, decorum, Miss Marta. She grinned as she walked out, only to turn back and say, Sir, Miss French is here. Shall I let her in? I heard the sharp intake of breath and the giggle Marta tried to hide with a cough. She slammed the door behind her. You need to fire that one, Miss French said. Good assistants are worth their weight in gold, and she's the best I've ever had. What do you require, Miss French? I read the dossier you had on the CEO and the board. How did you find all that out? I shrugged. Friends in low places. Not the most attractive picture. Still, the charity has merit if it can handle upper management. Those dossiers are going to land on most of the board's desks Monday. Let's see what happens from there. Did you rent a tux? No, I did not. I intend to wear the one hanging in my closet. Men can get away with wearing the same thing to events. Do you have a new dress? It wouldn't be proper to show up in something you've worn before. She took a deep breath. I do, and I assure you, we will be remembered. She started to leave and paused. Have lunch with me? Why? So we can get to know each other a little better. It wouldn't do to appear stiff before the crowds. I grinned. As you wish. When today? Meet me at Amaretto's at noon. Amaretto's was one of the hardest places in town to get a reservation. I hope the food lived up to the reputation. Marta grinned as I grabbed my suit jacket. Do you know what a black widow spider is and where the term came from? Once they mate, the female kills the male and consumes him. Watch out for webs, Jason. You'd be amazed at the traps I've successfully avoided in the past, Marta. Suffice to say, if she thinks she's going to get a virgin sacrifice, she will be most disappointed. Enjoy lunch. We arrived at the same time, and she looked over my car, grinning. Good choice. Where did you get yours? England, I replied. For the first time, she noticed the right-hand drive. We were seated immediately, and the wait staff fawned over her like she was royalty. Since it was an Italian restaurant, I spoke to the waiter in Italian, and he had no idea what I was saying. The owner, however, did. He came over to greet us and spoke to me in his native tongue, happy to hear it spoken again. After a few moments, I could see Pauline frowning. Please excuse us, Miss French. I take it you don't speak Italian? No, but it sounds like a beautiful language. Jeppy, the owner said with a smile, it is the language of love. Now, what can I offer you? Before she could speak, I ordered for both of us in Italian. He smiled and walked away. He hasn't taken my order yet, she noted. I ordered for both of us. 
He has a dish that was my favorite when I was in Milan, and I would like you to try it. Did the frost just thaw a little? So, you lived in Italy after England? I did, as part of my last job. I've also lived in Madrid, and of course, I was raised in London. I got my CV at Eton and an advanced degree from the University of Seville. Do you speak the languages? Yes, both French and Spanish, with a bit of Portuguese. Languages seem to come easily to me. Are you multilingual? She smiled. Yes, in fashion and food. Everything else requires English. The food arrived, and we ate. Jeppy hovered until I assured him it was the best version of the dish I'd ever tasted. He beamed and disappeared. After the main course, dessert and very rich coffee appeared. Lunch lasted 90 minutes. I waited with her as the valet brought up our cars. I received a call from the chairman of the board just before lunch. He is most anxious to meet with us tomorrow to discuss the results of our investigation. Will you be available? If you wish me to be available, I'm available. I opened the car door for her, and she surprised me by giving me a kiss on the cheek. Thank you for joining me, it was very enjoyable. Shall we say two tomorrow? I'll be there. Have a good afternoon, Miss French. Call me Pine, she said as she pulled away. Mara eyed me suspiciously when I returned. Once she saw that I still had all my fingers and toes, she relaxed. How did it go? Much better than expected. Apparently, the woman can blend in as a normal human being when she needs to. Still, I'd watch out for those F. Your messages are on your desk. We work through the afternoon. As I entered the condo, the doorman smirked. I wondered what that was about until I unlocked the door and saw what was on the other side. She was tall, blonde, blue-eyed, and, best of all, in a state of undress. Hi honey, I'm home. That was all I got out before she burst into giggles. I always wondered what it would be like to say that. A bit overrated, in my opinion, I said, kissing her cheek. She drew me into a full kiss. After she was satisfied, she pulled back. Be a dear and pour us a drink, would you? She plopped down on the sofa, her legs crossed. As I was fixing the drinks, another woman appeared out of the bedroom. She was also in a state of undress, her perfect dark-hued skin seeming to glow. Looking over at the woman on the couch, she laughed. Close those legs, you're like a dog chasing a car. You wouldn't have any idea what to do with it if you caught it. Lizzie, the blonde, and Carmela, the Hispanic, were confirmed partners, and they were married. I was living in their condo. Carmela had once told me she had never been with a man and had no desire to experiment. Victoria was another in my circle of friends. Anyone who had seen the cover of a glamour magazine in the previous five years had seen her face. I really didn't want to get into a relationship with a model, but she was determined, and I didn't fight it very hard. We progressed to the point where we made promises. Then I flew down for a shoot and caught her with the photographer and a production assistant. The photographer was female, and the assistant was male. She tried to say she was drunk, but if she was, it was from the night before, I caught them at 9 o'clock in the morning. Then she said they had drugged her, which offended the photographer so badly that she quit. I was in charge of the shoot, so I had to get a replacement. We met at the airport, me leaving and him arriving. He told me later it was one of the hardest shoots of his life because she would cry at random times, messing up her makeup and losing the light. A two-day shoot ended up taking a week. She tried several times to reconnect when she got home, but I was done with her. Her career lasted another three or four years before she faded away. Last I heard, she was doing catalog work as a plus-size model. I saw her time or two, and despite the weight, she still looked good. I made it a point to never date a model again. I had a few hookups, but that was all they were, ships passing in the night and all that. I finally got tired of the constant traveling, temper tantrums from staff, vendors, governmental flunkies, models, and dealing with corporate issues, so I left it all behind. I still got calls, and if I liked the person, I'd consult, but that's as far as it went. That's how I ended up in the condo. Lizzie and Carmela were going to be home for two weeks before going off to different shoots, and they just wanted to decompress. 
I pampered them and promised them a fishing trip on Sunday. I had gotten them into fly fishing, and they loved it. They bought all the necessary gear, and every outing looked like a fashion shoot. I thought about that one day while watching Les pull in a 13-inch brook trout. I made some calls, and suddenly they were on the cover of Fly Fishing magazine. The article followed them as they fished a private stream in the Smoky Mountains. It was their idea to wear bikini tops with their waders, they told the magazine it was to work on their tans. I had to laugh because most of the times I went with them, they were topless. Both hated tan lines for professional reasons. It became a recurring gig, the magazine would ask them back about twice a year to test and evaluate equipment. They didn't get paid, but they always got to go to some remote or exotic locations for the magazine, like New Zealand, Colorado, and the Swiss Alps. It turned out that North American trout had been imported to Switzerland when their native trout population was decimated by war and mismanagement. The odd side effect was that the native trout and the imports were genetically compatible and crossbred, creating trout that could weigh up to 30 pounds in a few years. It became the best-selling issue of the magazine in their history. One of their stipulations for doing those segments was that I had to accompany them if I had time. I even got featured in a couple of issues as their fishing guru, even though by then they were far more competent than I was. The Swiss segment was filmed and appeared as a documentary on their national television service and was picked up by Netflix. It remained one of their most popular documentaries, hot women in bikinis, spectacular scenery, and great fishing. It was almost impossible to mess up something like that. They also became active in conservation efforts, often attending fundraisers when their schedules permitted. Then they bought about 500 acres in the mountains of North Carolina, which had two good-sized trout streams. It was going to be where they built their retirement home. It seemed Mr. French was an avid fly fisherman and saw me in the magazines. He did a little research, and when I walked away from the modeling industry, he recruited me heavily. We did one of our first interviews on the banks of a stream while fishing. He mentioned that a man's character could be measured by the way he fished. I didn't entirely agree, but it was his perspective. Lizzie found out where I had landed and called me. If you haven't found a house or apartment yet, stop looking. We happen to live in this town, and we're gone a lot. Use our condo. Even though it was famous for their security, someone had gotten into our place, taken pictures, and rifled through all our stuff. We had surveillance, and they arrested the guy as he left the building. He had a backpack filled with almost every item of lingerie we owned. He said he was going to sell them on the internet, especially the ones that were in the laundry hamper. Worn supermodel panties go for big bucks, he said. It seemed I was sitting on a gold mine. I was sending you the codes and a letter of introduction to management. A lot of people who live there travel, and they're used to house sitters. Stay out of our laundry hamper, I said, but I think I'm too late. They found out about the charity fundraiser and googled it. Miss French, she's quite a looker, isn't she? And she knows it. Are you going to pursue that? I said, what is this, the guy's locker room in high school? I have no intention of pursuing that. I have a feeling the baggage she carries would weigh us down. I told them about the history I'd learned. Lizzie was looking at her picture on the company Facebook page. I do her, she said. Carmela was giving her the evil eye and tried to backtrack. That is, if I were just a casual guy and not someone desperately in love with his wife. Carmela grinned at the save. You hit that on the head. Jay has too many principles to just act on impulse. He works for her father. If he just pursued her and dumped her, she'd be crying on daddy's shoulder until he had to address the issue. They bannered back and forth leading up to the event. I should have known by the way they grinned that they were up to something, but Miss French was taking up too much of my time. We met with the chairman and a few board members he had vetted. He didn't like the information we provided so he held an emergency meeting. By the time of the gala, he was down a CEO, a CFO, a lawyer, and two board members. He kept it quiet before the event, but it would definitely cause a stir come Monday. My friends hovered over me like they were my mother's before sending me out to the limo. Pauline was living in a three-bedroom apartment above her father's five-car garage. She had a private entrance so her parents couldn't see when she came and went or if she was entertaining anyone. I expected to meet her there, but she texted me to meet her at her parents' place. 
I rang the bell on the ornate door promptly at 7.30. You would have thought we were 16 and going to our first prom by the way they fussed over us. Mr. French had called me one day with a problem. He was supposed to take his wife to lunch but had a situation that needed resolving with a vendor right away. Would I take her? I took her to Jeep and he again fawned over us like we were royalty. It improved his opinion of me quite a bit when I took Carmela and Lizzie there for dinner once. He had pictures of us hanging behind his bar, a sort of hall of fame for him. There was even one of him between them while both girls were kissing his cheek. Jeep was in his late sixties, and I was afraid he might have a heart attack. Mrs. French noticed, saying, You know these women, they're old friends, but they're still old friends. I said, Grinning, I've known them since Lizzie was 17 and Carmela was 20. We met through a job I had at the time, and I helped them out of an ugly situation once. After that, they kind of adopted me. Is it true they're lovers? They're not lovers, they're spouses. I was the best man to both at their wedding in Crete. They're very much in love, and I can easily see them growing old together. Have you ever known any models? I grinned and answered in my best eaten accent. Why, Mrs. French, are you asking me to kiss and tell? That would be unseemly, don't you think? She giggled like a schoolgirl. I think, dear Jason, that there's even more to you than my husband knows. Please excuse an old woman and her fantasies, she added. Have you not noticed the way Jeep stares at you and hovers over the table? He looks at you like you're the last bit of chocolate mousse in the universe. The woman dimpled when she smiled, and I found it very charming. She was very attractive for her age, and Mr. French seemed infatuated. I think I broke his heart when I told him she was happily married to one of the richest men in the state. After that, every time she was in the building, she would stop in and say hello. She even took Marta to lunch once and tried to find out more about me, but Marta knew very little and wasn't about to share what she did. A very frustrated Mrs. French dropped Marta off. Mrs. French was snapping pictures with a high-quality camera talking a mile a minute. Don't they look nice, Robert? Such a handsome couple. I bet they will turn heads when they appear on the floor. She prattled on a bit in excitement before Mr. French gently stopped her. Dear, let them go. You can amuse yourself thinking about the flowers for their wedding while they're out. You two play nice and don't embarrass the company. I expect a report by Monday afternoon. Miss French turned bright red at the mention of the flowers before giggling. White and pink, and I know just where to shop for the gown. You need to think about the next generation, they'll be giving us grandchildren. It was his turn to glow red. This was a point of contention between Pauline and her father, he wanted grandchildren to pass his legacy on to, and she was particularly stubborn about it. Add in the two failed engagements, and it looked like he would be waiting a while longer. The limo dropped us out front, and I thought it odd that they had a red carpet. The local news outlet was there in force, with cameras recording and shutters snapping at the speed of light. We got our share of attention. Her father was one of the biggest employers in the state and carried a lot of weight in the town. They knew immediately who Pauline was, and speculation about me was rampant. She was greeted like local royalty. Pauline loved the attention and the adulation of the masses, and I knew then that my original assessment of her was spot on. Miss French was more than a little narcissistic. I just smiled a lot and blended into the background as much as I could. Her father wanted her to be the face of the company, and she needed to be that face. Pauline caught on after about half an hour. What are you doing? Making sure you get your moment in the sun. Why? Because your father wants you to be the new face of his company. I don't want to detract from that. You should be by my side. We're the new face of the company right now. We are. Years down the road, long after I'm gone, I don't want them wondering what happened to me. It's best to keep the focus on you. I could tell she was frustrated. Why do you keep talking about leaving? You just barely got here. I shrugged. It isn't my company, and sooner or later, I'll go back to what I used to do. What exactly was that? Not this, I said which made her eyes tighten in anger. I had a feeling she wasn't used to people speaking to her like I did. She would have to learn to deal with life's little disappointments. Her smile remained fixed, though. We were introduced to new people and, in between, 
she spoke to old friends. Some struck me as frenemies, smiling as they patted her on the back, looking for a soft spot to sink the knife. One woman gushed cordiality, but her eyes suggested she'd rather kiss a snake. I grinned as she walked away. She doesn't like you very much, does she? Pauline shrugged before grinning. That's Nancy Wilde. We went to high school and college together. I stole a boyfriend from her, well, two actually, one in high school and one in college. Did you steal them because you wanted them or just to get under her skin? Pauline blushed, and I had my answer. Miss Wilde took every opportunity to flirt with me, much to the growing irritation of Miss French. You know what she's doing, right? I held up the card she had given me with her contact details. I'm guessing her actions follow the principle of payback, but I could be mistaken. It didn't surprise me much when Pauline snatched the card from my hands and tore it into little pieces. You would do that, she said. It's why she gave me two cards. Pauline stormed off toward the ladies' room, and I wandered up to the bar with two glasses of excellent red wine. I scanned the crowd and found her talking to a man I didn't know. She was clearly flirting, giving him all sorts of signals. When I walked up, I said, Ah, here you are, dear. She stiffened as I handed her a glass. I smiled. Well, you seem to be busy. Please excuse me while I mingle. I hadn't gone twenty steps before Lizzie appeared in the crowd, latching onto my arm and giving me a big kiss on the cheek. Carmela appeared an instant later, taking the other arm. They had gone all out, and comparing their presence to mine was like comparing a lantern to two comets blazing across the sky. Men and a few women were practically tripping over themselves to compliment them. We've been watching, Lizzy said. She's very beautiful. See how she's trying to make you jealous. How very high school of her. Are you sure you're interested in her? I don't know if I am or not, I replied. Like you said, she's behaving like a 16-year-old. Perhaps she had an event in her life that left her emotionally stunted. Oh my, she just noticed you with us. I can see the steam coming out of her ears from here, and now she's heading towards us. It didn't take long before she was standing before us, a quizzical look in her eyes. I see you finished your conversation with your friend. Please allow me to introduce Leslie O'Brien Valdez and Carmela Valdez, two very old friends of mine. Ladies, this is Miss Pauline French. Leslie smiled and shook her hand, while Carmela was a bit cooler, keeping her off balance. Good evening, Miss French. How is it you know our Jason? Carmela emphasized the word R with a smile. Pauline responded, he's my day for the night. Leslie took the opportunity for a little dig. Really? We thought by your actions that the man you were talking to was your date. More than your date, actually, I added. An old friend. I can see that the situation might be a bit tense. Yes, an old friend, Pauline said with a hint of irritation. A very close friend at one time. He's married now to a very lovely woman. You threw him back? No, we just had different goals and drifted apart. Jason, honey, we should mingle. Remember our purpose here. Carmela tightened her grip on my arm slightly when she called me honey, clearly enjoying the situation. Yes, dear ladies, it was lovely to see you here. A very pleasant surprise. Can I take it you support the charity? It seems worthwhile, Miss French replied, but we'll need to do a little research before we commit. I'll call Jason with our decision within a week. Have a pleasant evening. They both made a production out of kissing me on the cheek before walking off. Pauline was struggling to contain her curiosity. It was unusual for her to deal with women as beautiful as she was who treated her with indifference. It was clearly throwing her off her game. How well do you know them? Very well, in fact. Right now, I'm staying with them. They're quite lovely, don't you agree? Pauline yanked me out onto a terrace with a determined look on her face. You drive a luxury car, I recognize the designer who made your tux, and I know he's one of the most expensive in the world. You live with supermodels. Who the hell are you? I'm Jason. At your service, I said with a bow. The tux wasn't really that expensive, in fact, Alberto gave it to me as a gift for doing him a favor. My car was a bit pricey because I had some upgrades done, and Hopman says it's one of a kind. 
I'm actually house-sitting for the girls. They're between assignments at the moment. Her eyes rolled. So, you're close enough to a world-class designer that he gives you clothes, and you know the second-in-command at Mercedes-Benz well enough to discuss your custom-designed luxury car. Friends with anyone else I would know? Maybe if you counted half the clothing designers in the world, business magnates on four continents, assorted film stars, and most of the hottest models on the planet, I thought, though I didn't say that. I just told her that my former business brought me in contact with many people. We mingled and danced. When the orchestra started playing, she sighed as we glided across the floor. Of course, you dance as well as Fred Astaire. Is there anything you can't do? I can't draw a straight line, my cliff diving techniques are lacking, and I never could do the WAP dance well. But aside from that, I'm almost perfect, I said. She stiffened before starting to giggle. Well, it seems you're not perfect after all. In the spirit of confession, if I'm ever shooting at you, stand still. I can't hit. Don't let me drive angry, or we may not get where we're going. And never, under any circumstances, let me show you my Irish step dancing skills. I look like all my limbs are trying to leave my body at the same time. That's an interesting mental image. So then, since we're merely human, we should carry on. I found Pauline to be a bit territorial. She danced with a few dignitaries and the movers and shakers of the city, and she frowned when I danced with their wives and girlfriends, as well as with Leslie and Carmela. The icing on the cake happened when they played the tango by request. Her friend Nancy had given the orchestra leader $500 to play it, and she swooped down on me before anyone knew what was going on. I had been taught to dance in Argentina and Brazil and knew what I was doing. Pauline almost couldn't keep up. I put all the best moves I had learned into the routine, and by the end, it looked like we were having an intimate dance in the middle of the floor. I left her on the floor gasping for breath. I straightened my tux as I walked back to Pauline and my friends. Leslie looked like she was choking, while Carmela had a tight little smile. Pauline looked like she wanted to either confront me or, maybe both. I smiled. Miss me? She tried several times to form words so I just swept her back onto the dance floor. As we sedately twirled through a slow waltz, she relaxed and molded herself to me as much as possible. I had to admit she felt really nice. When we broke, she stroked my cheek. You're going to be hard to handle, aren't you? Asked the girls what happened to the last woman who tried to handle me. If you're in an honest relationship, you don't handle people, you work together towards a common goal. I saw her talking to the girls while the chairman cornered me. Do you think we can depend on your company for support? I can't answer that because I don't have the deciding vote. Miss French does, and she's already told me we'd evaluate our position after a discussion on Monday. He dropped the subject and made a beeline for Pauline. I saw her shake her head a couple of times, and the man's dejected expression suggested things might not work out as he'd hoped. As the hour grew late, we made our excuses. Leslie got one last dig in, asking if they should wait up for me. Pauline's frown deepened, but she was smiling by the time we got in the car. You have interesting friends, she said. I do. Ignorant or boring people aren't worth the time it takes to know them, so I avoid them and focus on those I find stimulating. She had slowly closed the gap between us as we traveled. Do you find me stimulating? Oh, very much, Miss French. By now, we were close, and I jumped when she playfully nipped my ear. Don't be flip. If you are, you might need surgery to replace pieces of your ear. And if you call me Miss French one more time, I'll consider it the ultimate flippancy. What would you prefer I call you? Well, honey would be nice. Dear wouldn't be unwelcome either. Duly noted, honey dear. Oh, goody, you already have a pet name for me. You have one other flaw we need to address as soon as possible. What would that be? You talk too much, she said before leaning in to kiss me. It was an intense few minutes as our tongues met and we embraced passionately. I was adjusting her dress while she was working on my pants when we heard the crunch of gravel, realizing we were on the ornate driveway of her father's house. We barely got ourselves together by the time the car stopped. We might have made it upstairs to her apartment if her mother hadn't been waiting under the columns flanking her front door. I helped Pauline out of the limo and walked her to the portico. Thank you, Miss French. 
It was a most pleasant evening. It was indeed, Mr. Holston. We must do something like this again soon, she replied with a grin. Her mother was staring at me before breaking out into a huge smile. I kissed both women on the cheek and took the car home. I walked in the door to find Leslie and Carmela in dressing gowns, drinking wine. They stared at me for a moment before giggles broke out. What's so funny? Go look in the mirror, they said. It seemed Pauline had a very distinctive color of lipstick that showed up well on my lips and cheek. No wonder her mother was laughing. I now understood the gleam in Pauline's eye. Did you? Leslie started. Did you have fun? Carmela chimed in. Swapped a little saliva, Les. That was it really. She looked like she was ready to keep going on the dance floor in front of everyone assembled. Why didn't you seal the deal? I looked at Carmela, who grinned. I'm afraid she watches too much television, especially softcore romances on cable. Seriously, I know she's very attractive and probably has plenty of experience, but I got an odd vibe from her. Nothing I can put my finger on without knowing her a bit better, but it was there. She's led an interesting life, I told them, sharing what I knew about her past, including the boyfriend stealing and the broken engagements. It sounds like she's a conqueror of sorts, Carmela observed. It's not about the person, it's about winning, scaling the heights, planting the flag, and moving to the next challenge. I'm sure you've encountered that in your work, and you know it never ends well. Carmela, besides being stunning and wealthy, also held a master's in psychology and was intent on getting her PhD when she retired. She was at the top of her form and had many years left. She once told me she was going to ride the train until it ran out of tracks. Leslie wasn't nearly as worldly. If it weren't for me and Carmela, she would be broke, believing every sob story and get-rich scheme she heard. It took Carmela demanding to be put in charge of her finances before they married to bring her around. Her fortune wasn't as large as Carmela's, but she could live comfortably on what she had. Carmela had her on a strict allowance, if you can call $10,000 a month strict. Leslie was almost always broke before the month was out. I think you may be right. Her old classmates warned me about her ways, and I can see it from time to time. I may date her after all, she looks almost as good as you ladies, but it will be just for fun. Leslie chimed in, yes, just for fun, and the sex, that's the fun part. The next morning, I went for a run to shake off the effects of the rich food and alcohol from the night before. I felt much better after my run, showered, and dressed. Mrs. French, who insisted I call her Monica, called to invite me to lunch on Sunday. I was surprised when I declined. I would love to, Monica, but my friends are leaving Monday, and I promised I'd spend the day with them. That would be those two supermodel friends of yours. Are you sure they're not interested in men? I'm positive. To my deep regret, she replied with a smile. No, honey, that's a good thing. It allows you to see what's out there. We grow some pretty nice girls locally, you know. I know that very well. Perhaps next week we'll go to JPE's Friday if you think it will be safe to let your husband see how much he desires you. Oh, Jason, I'd say you had a silver tongue, but that would be a lie. It's solid gold or maybe even platinum. See you Friday. A thought struck me. Monica, may I speak to your husband? Of course, dear. Hold on just a second. He came on the line quickly. He must have been right beside her. Hello, Jason. Good morning, sir. Let me ask you, have you ever fished Holloway Mountain? Are you kidding? Your rods have to be gold-plated just to get past the gates. I'd love to fish those streams, but I've never seen a trout worth that price. And that's one of the reasons you're so successful. I have an opportunity to fish there Sunday. Would you like to come? It wouldn't cost you a dime, and I'm sure my friends would enjoy fishing with someone new. They say I irritate them. I think it's because I don't take it as seriously as they do. I call it their fish head mode, and it irritates them no end. Seriously, when I hang up, I'm going to slap Monica for not giving birth to you. What time do we need to meet at the resort? No later than six to get as much time in as possible. Can you do that? Oh, and I think Monica has plans for me that would be illegal if we were related, so give her a big kiss instead. 
I bow to your wisdom. My tongue will be massaging her tonsils as soon as we disconnect. I'll be there with bells on. Don't do that, it would scare the fish. I heard her giggle and his laughter as they disconnected. Two hours later, I got another call. I hear you sabotaged my plans for Sunday. Sorry, honey dear, previous commitment. Her tone softened. All right, but after this, I expect a lot of commitments to be with me. Are you positive they're not interested in men? As a matter of fact, they've invited me to help broaden their horizons. It should be very educational. I heard her sharp breath. You're a bit of an ass. Anyone ever tell you that? If I thought for one minute the least bit of what you just said was true, it would mean I'd have three asses to whip. I doubt seriously you need further lessons, but if you do, they will come for me. Understand? You don't own me. Her laughter went on for a minute. When she caught her breath, I could hear the smirk in her voice. You keep on thinking that. It'll make the chase that much more fun. Yes, honey dear. Good. I'll see you Monday. Rob insisted I call him by his given name since we were off the clock. He met us at the resort, and I thought his eyes would pop out of his head when he saw who got out of the Range Rover. The ladies were in tight jeans and long sleeve tops because the weather was still a bit cool, but even in their waders, they would have turned heads. They got him over his nervousness by talking about fishing and particular flies they were fond of using while I pulled the equipment out of the boot. The guide we were using introduced himself and got us into some off road vehicles. I grinned when I noticed he had the girls in his cart while Rob and I followed in another. It took almost an hour to get to the stretch of stream we had been assigned and another 20 minutes to rig up. In a move that disappointed the guide greatly, Carmela decided I would be her partner and Les would fish with Rob. We fished until 11 o'clock, then broke for lunch. We'd all caught fish, some of decent size, but this stretch was designated catch and release, so we didn't get to keep them. Rob became even more impressed when we were taken to a little shelter 20 minutes up the trail that had full amenities. Lunch was an impressive choice of rack of lamb or roast duck, both with veggies designed to complement the meat. There was even a small dessert. We ate sparingly, not wanting to carry a heavy load as we balanced on rocks, but it was hard. We stayed for about 20 minutes after the meal, enjoying coffee and relaxing. When it was time, they took us to another larger stream with a lot of deep pools and impressive runs. I partnered with Leslie while Carmela took Rob. We talked as best we could while we fished. He really likes you, Jason. I think he has a lot of plans for you, even if you and his daughter don't click. He's worried about her and thinks someone like you would be good for her. She's used to being the biggest fish in the pond and has never been exposed to anyone who swims with the sharks. He thinks you scare her a little, and he loves it. He's a good man. I think highly of him. I think I make him a little nervous as well. The shadows were getting long, and we were about to pack it in when we heard the shouting and whooping going on. Leslie and I walked down the stream to find Rob celebrating. He'd caught a 25-inch, 14-pound trout, according to the tape and scales, the stream record. Most would have taken it home and mounted it on a wall, but after the pictures were taken, he gently put it back in the stream. It was the catch of a lifetime, he said as he let it go. I want another fisherman to experience the same emotions I felt when it struck. Later, they printed out the pictures for him on professional quality paper. One went on the lodge wall, and he framed the one of him holding the fish flanked by two supermodels and hung it at home. It was the first thing anyone saw when entering his office. He got about 15 seconds of fame when he was featured in the Big Catch section of Fly Fishing Magazine, with a glowing commendation for releasing the fish back into the wild. He kept a couple of copies in his office for years, and if he needed a calming moment, he would pull one out and look at it. Monica seemed a little left out, and I had a thought that next time the girls were home, there would be a spa adventure in her future. Pine didn't know what to think, but in the end, she decided to be happy for her father. You would think that when supermodels travel, they would have mountains of bags, but for the majority of them, that just wasn't true. There wasn't really any reason for them to bring a lot because they knew everything they needed would be provided. They were fashion models after all, and they often kept the clothes they wore, becoming walking billboards for the designer. Les and Carmela carried just an overhead bag each, and that was it. I took them to the airport, 
and after kisses and hugs, they were off. It would be five weeks before they were home again. As they were going through security, Les looked back and grinned. Stay out of our laundry hamper. Besides, we sent it all to our service this morning. Be a dear and put away our bras and panties when they get back, will you? And don't you dare wear them, it stretches them horribly. Carmela smirked as an old lady beside me looked shocked. I tried to comfort her. I can assure you, madam, I do not wear their lingerie. It's too tight, and mine are much sexier. Have a pleasant trip. Marta and I caught up Monday morning. She told me how handsome I looked, and I grinned. I'm glad I wasn't your date. I can fight a little, but I don't think I could have beaten the horde back by myself. She glowed a little and giggled. I had a lot of fun. Mark was just a friend, and he was impressed when I asked him to go with me. It led to expectations, and those led to disappointment. Still, I was asked a dozen times for my number. I even gave it to three who seemed like nice men. I have a date Friday and one Sunday. The third had to go out of town, but we'll be spending time together when he returns. Enough about me. How was your date with the princess? It went surprisingly well. I'm starting to think somewhere under that mantle of entitlement may be a person worth knowing, but the jury is still out. Did you manage to pick up any interesting tidbits? She frowned. I think there may be a little trouble in charity land. I talked to the second tier mostly, and they all seem unhappy. I spoke with a junior accountant, and he told me, in so many words, he felt like they were due to be investigated soon. He was a little tipsy when he told me, and as soon as he started talking, he was whisked away. That fits with what I've managed to dig up. I think my suggestion would be to seek another charity. And that's why they pay you the big bucks. Marta was a little surprised when I told her she would be going to my meeting with Pauline that afternoon. Pauline seemed a little miffed that I had brought her along as well, but by the time the meeting was over, they seemed to be getting unwell. Pauline and I came to an agreement and contacted the chairman. I suggested it might be best if I took the lead since you still have to live here. He wasn't involved in any of the shenanigans that went on at the lower levels. He was, however, supposed to be keeping an eye on things and drop the ball. He may be useful later, so I'll be the bad guy, and you'll still have an opportunity to build a bridge down the road when he may be useful. Pauline was looking at me oddly. How far ahead do you think? Are there any more like Mart out there, eyes and ears for you? I grinned. Honey dear, that's a need-to-know situation. I always set my goals, analyze the best way to get there, and gather as much information as I can before I act, a system that has stood me in good stead. She grinned at the title. I have my own plans, you know. I can't reveal the details, but you'll know soon enough what they are. Leeton made the call. We set it up in her office on a conference call. We got the pleasantries out of the way quickly. Mr. Wells, I am sorry to inform you that we will not be supporting your charity. We do wish you luck, and there may be specific actions your charity takes that we may participate in, but for now, that's all we're willing to do. I'm struggling here. Can you share anything? Any way we can work together? Mr. Wells, how much did last Friday's event cost the charity? I don't have those exact numbers. I do know that counting the venue, the caterers, the valet parking, the orchestra, and the bar, it took roughly $150,000. And you hold two such events a year, according to my sources. You netted roughly $225,000 in contributions which is roughly half of what it cost you to stage it. That's not a very good return on investment. Your operating cost for the charity is $3 million a year, with two-thirds of that going to salaries. Your CEO was pulling in close to a million, the lawyer was billing a significant amount in hours, and the CFO was approving the amounts and set his salary at $359,000. Two of the board members profit from contracts with your organization. Roughly 80% of donations went to operating costs, leaving very little for the purpose the charity was funded for, helping people who need it. There was a little silence as he gathered his thoughts. I would ask if your numbers are correct, but I believe they are. I've asked for an outside audit that I'm sure will reveal a lot of misdeeds. The thing that sticks in my craw is that the lawyer put in parachutes in case they were ever caught. 
According to their contracts, if we fire them, they get a year's salary in severance agreements. I would advise you to take legal action, but I doubt you would get very far. You cannot beat them in court, sir, so I suggest you take it to the people. Expose the bad actors for what they are. It will make it more difficult for them to get similar positions elsewhere and might gain you a bit of sympathy with your contributors. Take a full page ad in the local paper, apologize to everyone, and list the ones who damaged the reputation of the charity. Reorganize, and in a year we'll revisit this discussion. We rang off, and Pauline looked at me. Think he'll take your advice? I think, in the end, he's going to get a lot of advice and a few legal opinions, but he will have to do something along the lines I laid out, or the charity will cease to exist. We discussed other worthwhile endeavors, and Marta suggested looking into literacy projects, both here and abroad. I think it would astound you how many people in this world cannot read or write. I didn't learn to read and write until my mother moved us to America when I was nine years old. The overheads are fairly low on projects like this, and the exposure is very positive. Pauline surprised me by agreeing with the idea, then asked Marta to spearhead the research. There are still a few more commitments we have to evaluate. If there is to be an event, I agree with Jason's opinion that you should also tend not to mingle with us because if they even suspect you are employed by the company, they may not be as free in their opinions. Agreed. Oh, and make sure to get a few more gowns. You need to look like you belong there. God knows you're pretty enough to garner attention, and the company will defray the costs. We'll fund it under research. No more lavish ones, though, that's a bit much. Marta couldn't hide the smile on her face as she left, and I think her opinion of Miss French went up considerably. I wasn't thinking when I spoke. Miss French lunged across the table and grabbed my head. I thought she was going to kiss me until she zeroed in on an ear and bit down hard. Ow. What was that for? I don't think your memory is that bad. I think we need to establish a policy here. Every time you don't call me by my name, it'll be a bite or three kisses, whichever you decide is less painful. And I will collect for sure every time. No exceptions. This is not negotiable. I let the silence linger a little before answering. Yes, honey dear. Better. And use your imagination. A sweetie or other kind of endearment would be nice occasionally. Noted, sweetie. Sugar baby. I'll work on a list. Now, it's time to go back to work. We stood, and she instituted another rule. Every time we were in private, I was to kiss her hello and goodbye. I'm starting to think I'm going to need a manual. I'll print one up for you. Study it. There will be tests. Yes, sweetie pie. That got another kiss and a shove out the door. Go to work. Make my daddy money. See you Friday. Friday? If I could reach you, I'd bite you. Yes, Friday. Did you seriously think I would let you take my parents out to dinner without me being there? You might say something stupid like we're not serious and I would end up doing damage control. Marta was busy, no doubt setting up shopping trips, and barely acknowledged me when I got back to the office. I sat staring out the window and grinning. Miss French was about to find out that making me do something I didn't want would be only slightly less difficult than handling rabid cats. I dressed for the occasion. After all, it was the boss and his wife, a certain amount of politeness would be required, and I wanted to be dressed for it. The suit I chose was one I'd had made in London just before I left, and I hadn't had the occasion to wear it yet. We met at the restaurant. Just as Seppi made a beeline for Monica before he saw Rob and peeled away, Pauline wore an understated little black dress that was simple and elegant but at the same time stylish. I recognized the designer, in fact, now that I thought about it, I'd seen that exact dress on Leslie at a shoot. You look lovely, Miss Pauline. Very fetching indeed. Monica stood grinning while Rob suggested we get our table. It was the chef's table for VIPs and special guests. We talked in generalities, and I commented on the dish we were having, saying that it was very good, but there was a little bistro on the smaller streets of Milan that was even better. I'd love to taste it, said Pauline. Perhaps I'll take you to lunch there one day. Her eyes widened, and I noticed for the first time she shared her mother's dimples. It's a date, she said. 
Rob wanted to talk about our fishing expedition, but Monica shut him down quickly. Dear, if you mention fish one more time during the evening tonight, you'll be sleeping with them. Rob immediately changed the subject, talking about the charity search. So far, every effort had been disappointing. Pauline brought up the literacy project, which Rob liked, complimenting her on the idea. He was surprised when she told him the credit should go to Marta because it was her suggestion. We were having a really good time, lingering over our coffee, when things took a turn. One of the men Pauline had dated and then broken up with was at the restaurant with a date. When he saw her sitting with her parents and a stranger and having a good time, it offended him. Pauline let out a little gasp when she saw him. I was on the opposite side of the table and was out of my chair before he made it to the table. He'd obviously had a lot to drink because he was weaving, but his tongue still worked. Hello. I see you've got a new sucker on the line. How long will he last? A week? A month? Long enough to fall in love with you so you can break his heart? You're heartless, but you know that, don't you? You'll end up hurting everyone who pays attention to you and die old and alone. Luckily, he wasn't loud, but people were starting to stare by then. I was around the table with my hands held up. Sir, please do not make a scene. I think you should go back to your table. Miss French obviously doesn't care for your company. He turned his bloodshot eyes to me, something new for the focus of his anger. He opened his mouth, and I put my left hand in it, pressing as hard as I could. He immediately started choking and gagging, and I had him by the shoulders, walking him away from the table. Jeppy intercepted me with two waiters and walked him outside, tossing him on the sidewalk. He immediately started vomiting, with my hand and the alcohol not agreeing with each other, then he passed out. Jeppy called the police, as having a passed out drunk on the sidewalk of his restaurant was really bad for business. His date was crying, and Jeppy ordered her a car. We were at the end of the meal, so we left just in time to see her getting into the vehicle and him still lying on the sidewalk. Before anyone could stop her, Pauline walked over and stepped on his foot with the stiletto heel of her designer shoes. Even from where her mother was standing, you could hear the high-pitched whine. I took her arm and led her away, giving her my handkerchief for her tears. I'm sorry our night got ruined. If you don't mind, I'll see your daughter home. Rob shook my hand with passion while Monica covered my cheeks with kisses. I didn't ask, I just drove to the condo and brought her in. I gave her a brandy to help her get composed, and we talked. I think she told me things about herself she'd never told anyone, and I just comforted her and let her get it out. An hour later, she dozed off, snuggled under my arm. I picked her up and carried her to bed, taking off her shoes and unzipping her dress. I stripped down to my shorts and crawled in beside her. She snuggled in, and I was asleep in a matter of seconds. I felt her eyes on me and woke up. Good morning. Breakfast? Coffee? I dressed and set up the pot while she freshened up. She was a bit despondent and quiet as she sipped. Putting it aside, she looked at me. I had a first last night. It was the only time in my adult life that I slept with a man and still woke up clothed. That wasn't very good for my ego. Probably not, but it was good for your spirit. You were with a man who thought enough of you not to take advantage when you were emotionally unstable. Tell me that doesn't mean anything. She started crying, and it took me a while to calm her down. She went to wash her face and came back giggling. I'm going to have to do the walk of shame and have nothing to be ashamed of. It's a bit depressing. Maybe not. I went into the girls' bedroom and looked through their closets, picking out cream-colored linen pants and a pale yellow top. I grinned as I thought about what Leslie had said while going through their lingerie drawers, picking a brand new bra and panty set. Manufacturers were always sending them things hoping to get them to wear and perhaps model them. These were from a high-end lingerie maker in France, hand-cut and stitched. I carried them out and gave them to her. These should fit. I'm sure they won't mind loaning them to you. The underwear is brand new. The panties should fit, but the bra is probably a size too small. It may be optional. She read the labels. How did you know? Years of experience. You're on your own as far as makeup and hair. When you're dressed, I'll take you to brunch. I was used to the speed models got ready and knew it would be a while with her, but she was back in 20 minutes. 
Apparently, she had a kid in her purse because she had an understated eyeshadow, light pink lipstick, and her hair was up in a high ponytail. The outfit, combined with the ponytail, made her look younger and a bit more innocent. I quite enjoyed the look. Do you have any idea what these clothes would cost retail? No, but your look would make it worth the cost. I noticed her reacting with playful enthusiasm as she gently dabbed my lips with a tissue. I ought to leave it on there just so everyone knows you're claimed. Come on, I'm suddenly famished. She knew the restaurant well, and between the French toast, the omelets, and the three blood orange mimosas we had, we were quite full. She went into full pout mode when I took her home. I laughed and kissed her cheek. Rest up, you have a big day tomorrow. Wear jeans or canvas if you have any, and a comfortable pair of shoes. By comfortable, I don't mean high heels or sandals. We'll be outdoors most of the day. I'll be by at seven. If you're not up or ready, I'll go without you. Understand, sugar pumpkin? She tried hard not to smile, but failed. I waved to Monica as she made a beeline for the apartment, wondering how disappointed she might be that we didn't have a more passionate evening. She was out front when I pulled up, surprised at the vehicle I was using, the Range Rover. The girls asked me to drive it from time to time to keep it functional. She got into the SUV without a word. Rob met me as I was pulling out. Are you taking her where I think you're taking her? If you are, good luck. She's fought me tooth and nail over the years about it. Well, then I hope she keeps her claws retracted. If not, we'll be back early. She eyed me as I pulled onto the highway. What was that about? Nothing, sugar dumpling. She tried to stop the smile, but it came through when we pulled through the gates of Holloway Mountain. She tensed up. Why are we here? Well, I intend to do a little fishing and hope to enjoy your company. If the thought is so appalling to you, they have a very nice spa here. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. She thought for a minute before deciding, I'll spend the morning with you, but if this is as bad as I think it's going to be, then my afternoon will be spent enjoying the amenities, all of them. Good enough. Breakfast first. The restaurant at the spa was rated four Michelin stars, and I think they underrated it. Tempted as I was, I ate lightly, and Pauline noticed, following my example. Chastity was to be our guide that day. I thought Pauline would be more receptive with Chastity around her, but her threat assessment radar clicked on, and it wasn't until I asked about Chastity's new baby that it shut down. Chastity showed her how to use the rod and the basics of fishing. Pauline looked up and saw me filming with my phone. What are you doing? Recording this for your father. He made me promise under threat of immediate termination if I didn't. Try not to fall in the water. We were on what the guide called Novice Creek, a medium stream with soft flowing curves and little overhang. Pauline was very determined and saw this as a test, so she really paid attention and concentrated. Chastity had to talk her into relaxing, telling her if she was too tense she wouldn't be able to cast well. I was glad to record her first fish, a little 8-inch rainbow trout. The way she laughed and celebrated, you'd have thought she had landed Moby Dick. I had to take about 10 pictures of her before Chastity showed her how to remove the hook and release the catch. I thought this might be a deal breaker, but she was very gentle with the fish. Of course, she whipped out some wet wipes and cleaned her hands afterwards. She almost didn't want to break for lunch because she was having so much fun. How many did you catch? None, honey bunch. I was here today for you to enjoy this. I may cast a few after lunch, but this morning was all about you. I showed her the highlights of the morning, and she got excited all over again. Chastity came into the dining room ringing a bell. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Pauline French, a virgin no more. She's one of us now. There were television screens in the room because it doubled as a sports bar on the weekends, and they all lit up showing her catch. Her smile as she posed was brighter than sunshine. There was a round of applause, and many came by to congratulate her. She talked about it on the way to the new stream. I think most of the important people in the state were in that room. Do you have any idea how gratifying it was to have a state Supreme Court judge give you a fist bump and say you go, girl? So that's what he does. I always wondered about that. Those people don't bother you at all. Not really. When we're at the lodge, we try to leave our day jobs behind. 
I'm sure they network with people they meet here, but they keep it away as much as possible. They're here for the fish, the spa, the pool, and the tennis courts. Maybe even the championship golf course. The state amateur championship was held here last year. Do you golf? She kind of swelled with pride. I was on the golf team with Rosie Cho at college. We won all the way through regionals before an Ivy League team knocked us out in the semifinals. Rosie Cho was the hottest thing in women's golf this year, winning three tournaments so far, and the season wasn't half over. We must play sometime, it's been a while. Where did you play last? St. Andrews. Pauline just rolled her eyes and changed the subject. This stream was a bit trickier, and she managed to snag the line twice before she got the rhythm down. We were almost done for the day when it happened, Pauline had hooked what could only be described as a big one. Both Chastity and I hovered and coached her. She took a step and dropped into a pool about three and one slash two feet deep, going all the way under, except for the hand that held the rod, which stuck straight up from the water. As Pauline popped up, shaking her head like a wet spaniel, the fish was still on the line. It took another five minutes to reel it in. It looked suspiciously like the fish her father had caught, except it was three inches longer and four pounds heavier. It broke the club record, and after we verified everything, she gently put it back in the water after insisting I take one more photo of her kissing the fish. The clubhouse had heard the news, and the excitement was palpable. I signaled the bartenders, and the spirits flowed. The story continues in the next video. Link to part 2 in the description of this video. Thank you for watching and for your likes.